Hey, welcome to OBD Nerds and thanks for checking out our channel. Today I'm going to go over live data and how it can help you when you're troubleshooting diagnostic trouble codes that you get on your OBD meter. Um, this is a cheap meter I just picked up on Amazon. It was under 20 bucks and it said it had live data so I have a habit of buying these cheap meters just to kind of see how they perform and, um, and what you can get for this type of a price point. So anyways, um, meters have come a long ways. In the past, I mean, you used to just be able to get your diagnostic trouble codes, but now you can get freeze data, you can get, you know, live data, you can sometimes graph. Um, so anyways, we'll run through some of these live data descriptions and kind of what they mean. So, okay, I got the meter uh, plugged in and we'll get started. Now, one thing I should probably mention is um, a lot of these DTCs, diagnostic trouble codes, are recommendations and stuff by the... Um, Gosh, it's the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, and uh, manufacturers, most manufacturers follow these, but sometimes um, they don't, and there's also manufacturer-specific trouble codes, and meters are different, so sometimes when we kind of go through these, the acronyms they'll kind of list might be slightly different on your meter compared to what you see here, and different cars are different. So anyways, uh, this is just kind of a general idea of kind of what these mean, and hopefully you'll find it useful and it will help out. So looking at this first page right here, it just popped up going into live data, is kind of odd. Um, we have FuelSys 2. Now I kind of expected to see FuelSys 1 and FuelSys 2. Um, so this is a little odd. So here's kind of a, a just a, I took a photo of, this is another under $20 meter I have, and it shows you the fuel system one and the fuel system two, and it's stating that the fuel system is in a CL, which is a closed loop. The other option is open loop, and there are actually a few more options, but um, the main are going to be closed loop or open loop, and you know the, the closed loop is where you're using your sensors as feedback to determine that fuel mix and the open loop, it, it's not using those sensors for that feedback. So most of the troubleshooting is kind of done in closed loop. And you kind of want to be able to see that you're in, in a closed loop mode. I mean, if your car's warmed up, you, you probably are. But it's still just good to know. So maybe there's another spot on this meter where it does say that. Um, it's just kind of odd that right here at the beginning it says fuel system 2 and not fuel system 1. And I kind of went through it and I didn't see it when I scanned through these pages. Next on the list, this one says load percentage. And it's sitting around 31. Now this is probably um, you know the same as calculated load value, or sometimes you might see calculated engine load value. But basically, um, your current airflow um, over your maximum airflow, and it's basically an indication of the engine capacity being used. Um, I, I think wide open throttle would probably be about 100%. You know, if you're all out. But um, so that's a that's another one. Um, and again, it might vary a little bit on your meter. Um, and I think for the range for this car here is around um, 0 to 30 percent when idling and I do have the air conditioning on so that's probably taking up a little bit more load. Now the next one is ETC and it's measured in Fahrenheit. I'd already set this up to measure stuff in Fahrenheit but um, I think that's a typo. I think it's ECT and the engine coolant temperature so I guess maybe I don't know. Maybe they went and meant engine temperature coolant or anything, but if you look on my other meter here, you can see um, it's ECT, and I think ECT is kind of what I see more often as engine coolant temperature. So, anyways, maybe maybe meant to be that way, maybe not. I'm not sure. I suppose I could switch meters, but uh, I already got started on this one, so I'll keep going. Okay, now we're to the probably the two best. Um, measurements that you're going to get here on your real-time uh, live data and that's going to be your short-term fuel trim and your long-term fuel trim so basically we'll start off with um oh and, and I, I should go over the bank um it's short-term fuel trim bank one and long-term fuel trim bank one and then if you see it says at the very bottom short-term fuel trim two not applicable and basically bank one means and you'll see this in your oxygen sensors and some other stuff too but um Bank one would be if you have like a single engine bank. So think of it as like your four cylinder engine, um, just a standard straight four cylinder engine. This could be one bank. Now, if you had a V engine to where you have two cylinder banks, so you know, you got your opposing cylinder banks. So you have bank one and bank two. So um, 
or B4, or B6, V8. It's going to be the same if though they're going to have two banks. Whereas your inline, if it's an inline four and an inline six, is going to be like one bank. Um, so, anyways, that's your banks. So, anyways, getting back to short-term fuel trim, your engine's basically trying to always keep the exact perfect fuel air mixture. So, basically, um, there's a formula for it, but it's like one gram of fuel for each 14.64 grams of air. Um, it's called the the stoichiometric air fuel ratio but basically your engine is always trying to keep that perfect air fuel ratio so if it detects that um you're in a situation where your engine where it's running lean through the sensors in a closed loop situation where it's getting information from these sensors and it's detecting that you're running lean it's going to add more fuel to the system and that's where you get that positive fuel trim so that percentage you'll see on there will go to the into positive and then if it's detecting that, hey, the system's through these sensors, you know, it, that it's too rich, then it's going to start reducing fuel. And that's where you see that negative number in your fuel trim. And it's, you know, in a percentage. So a certain amount here is going to be normal. So generally, I feel comfortable if I don't see double digits. You know, if it's they're both in the single digits, you know, it, it's doing pretty good. Now, the short term's going to kind of fluctuate up and down a little bit, and that's kind of what it's supposed to do. Kind of goes back and forth from a little rich to a little lean, a little rich, and that kind of helps the catalytic converter work properly. Now, the long term trails the short term. So it's, you know, I don't know, 20 seconds or something. Um, but basically, it's it's going to kind of follow along. So if you did get in a situation to where the short term, like maybe something happened, and the short term's running at a constant 20%, the long term will creep up to that 20% eventually, and then the short term can go back to where it can kind of bounce around that zero range again. And when you turn off your car, the short term goes away. But the long term will retain that last value it was when you start that car back up that's stored in the memory. Basically, what I, what I look for is I, I just don't want it to be in the double digits, you know. So, um, I mean, if, it, if it's in the double digits, you probably want to start looking into it, even though if your service manual might say, you know, I think plus or minus 20%. Um, but if you're looking at, and you see like uh, your long-term fuel trims, you know, maybe they're greater than 10%, um, that's kind of because like the PCM thinks that it's running lean and it's adding more fuel to bring that short term back up. Um, so basically that could be like, you know, you have unmeasured air coming in and hitting your combustion chamber or less fuel hitting the combustion chamber. So the, um, that, that it's trying to bring the computer saying, hey, let's put more, add more fuel because we're, we're detecting that it's in, in a, this lean condition. And so that, that kind of gives you a sign that there's something else that you need to really dig into and look for. So um, it's kind of a bigger subject probably than this video. And I see I've already taken quite a bit on long term and short term and i probably didn't even get much information out there but i'll try to do a separate video just on those and i, I know there's some other vid good videos out there but um hope that quick explanation helps okay next is rpm i think everybody probably knows this one um basically how fast your engine is running it's in uh rotations per minute or maybe i think it's revolutions per minute and it's how many times that your crankshaft will go, you know, spinning. So how many times that crankshaft makes a full turn each minute. Um, you may have a tack in your car that measures this. Uh, this little car does not. Um, I kind of wish they put tacks in every car. Um, but I guess cost effectiveness or something. I don't know why they don't do that. But anyways, this meter does read it. And um, most of these little handhelds that have this real-time data, live data, are going to be able to read your RPMs. Now next, um, you know, I, I jumped straight to RPM because that was the next one that had a measurement. I have two above it that are NA, but um, the FRP is, I. this car doesn't have it, but I'm assuming that's your fuel rail pressure uh, measured in pounds per square inch, you see there, and your map. And your map is gonna be um, a map sensor, which is a uh, manifold, uh, manifold absolute pressure. And this is probably located around your intake manifold, um, maybe right before it or on your intake manifold. Next up is the speed. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory too. And uh, that's just taken from like your, uh, when your, your vehicle speed sensor. And uh, it can also be used for other things like, you know, cruise control or 
traction control and that type of type of stuff. Uh, next is Spark Advance. Um, that's basically the current spark timing in degrees, um, which could be good to look at as well. For this car, the manual lists um, ignition advance as uh, 0 to 14 degrees when idling, so that looks like it's right in that range. Spark Advance kind of, I guess, refers to that, that time before your pistons reach top dead center uh, when that spark is initiated. Wow, this video is taking a lot longer than I than I originally expected, so it's over 10 minutes already. Um, I'm going to go ahead and split this up and do two parts, so um, I'll go ahead and get this posted. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, if, you, if you like the content, I um, would love to see um, some likes. Um, if you don't, some thumbs down. Let me know what you think. Um, if, you, if you got cool OD, OBD2 tips, you know, drop them in the comments. Um, if you like the content, um, it'd be great to have some subscribers as well. Um, since it's a new channel. So anyways, uh, thank you so much and uh, you guys have a good rest of your day and I'll get part two up soon as well.